representing groups or groups that are or people who are representing groups, anyone of that nature, okay, who have presentations perhaps. Okay, you, sir, all right, come on up. I saw a hand over here go up and down. Are you are you also for people that can't be here? Would that be considered group? Close, but not quite. <laughs> but go ahead. But we'll we'll make sure you get a chance though. All right, sir, if you give us your name, you may have the floor. Okay, before I start, I, I see the red light on. You're good. You're good. I'm good to go. Thank you. I know you think it'd be crazy, but it's right. Yeah. <laughs> if you could put up <laughs> you could put up my slides, please. Thank you. And your name is? My name is Dr. Abraham Shearer, and I'm a resident of Eagle Crest Aerodome Homeowners Association, and I've been asked by the Homeowners Association to speak on their behalf. Great. Okay. Technology is great when it works. If we have a seven-year-old here, he could probably help us out. <laughs> I think we're dealing with information overload. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? Mr. Chairman, we're just going to put the flash drive in, and that's probably faster. So yeah, just, I agree. Yep. yep, no problem. Yeah. It's the second one. No, that's it. That's it. Ready to go. Okay. Um, do, can I, do I control the slides? You can pick left and right on the keyboard or roll the mouse. And... Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for giving me the uh, honor of speaking to the um, board of the Planning and Zoning. Um, in an interest to move things along, um, I'm not going to be uh, reading everything on the slide, but I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself, and uh, you can read it on the slide. Uh, I've been in this community over 15 years. Um, I wake up every morning when I go to the hospital, and my goal is to help people, and that's what I'm all about. Um, I've probably taken care of... Uh, Family members here. I was director of neurology over at BB for 14 years. I'm over at B Health right now. So I recognize people that I've taken care of. I've taken care of family members, your brothers, your sisters. And uh, I'm very, uh, I, I, I feel that this place is my home, my children's home. And um, I just want to let you know a little bit about myself. And the other thing I want to say. Um, I have done expert witness testimony in the United States and various states, also in Delaware. Um, I consider myself a medical expert in uh, neurobiology, neurology, psychiatry. I've testified in uh, Delaware in those uh, areas. And um, I need to mention, as far as the, the Delta report goes, I really wish that they had contacted someone from Eagles Crest to also get our opinion in my business. And I'm going to be talking mostly as a physician in my business when you have a one-sided report, it usually gets thrown out of court. No one ever came to us. No one asked us. There's a lot of errors in his report regarding the size of the aircraft, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. But usually it's a one-sided report. We call that in medicine a hired gun. I'm not calling them a hired gun. I'm just telling you what we call that in medicine. Um, our uh, airport uh, was established in, in um, 1952, um, and um, in May... 2018, Sussex County Board of Adjustments reaffirmed the legal non-conforming use of Eagle Crest Aerodome. A twin mass will be built approximately one half a mile from our runway uh, going north. Um, also, I want, to, I want to let you know that the uh, airport was established by uh, Joseph Roland Hudson in 1948. Uh, he believed as well as I do, and a lot of members of uh, Eagle Crest Aerodome, that service is above self. And he was inducted into Delaware Hall of Fame. He was an avid flyer. Um, you're going to hear a lot of terminology, just to let you know. We are located on the uh, 
Federal Aviation Map. We're located uh, here in, in uh, Milton, Delaware. We're called DE-25. We have uh, 25 single um, engine, um, it's the home for 25 um, single engine and multiple engine aircraft and, and um, helicopters as well. So again, as far as the report goes, address single engine aircraft and very respectfully, um, I believe that there's more to um, the report that you should know, which would, uh, which I was hoping you would be able to contact us. And again, no one ever contacted us. We have, we have one runway, one goes south, which is one rate 14. We have another runway, number 32, which goes north. We're the second largest airport in the county and the fifth largest airport in the state. Uh, in Um, so, and I'd like to quote one of, the, one of the, the chairman, actually, of the board, and he said, we've done a good job protecting people who were here first. Uh, at the last meeting, um, Mr. Wheatley uh, spoke about Atlantic Cement, I think they're in Lewis, and he said, you've been protecting them. I know the community, a lot of times, are not happy they're there. I've been on that road, and a lot of times there's dust coming out of the plant, and uh, it, it, they've been there first, and I know that I appreciate that you take uh, uh, pride in protecting people that were here first. Also, um, there's 25 families who reside in, in our community. I'm here basically to speak on behalf of the community. We consider ourselves a flying community. And um, last time we were here, Mr. Wheatley also said that he likes to have the statutes and he likes to be able to look at these. I know that you're aware of them, but I thought I'd, I'd like to put it on the record. Uh, zoning County, uh, Zoning County Chapter 68, Planning and Zoning, uh, exists for the purpose of promoting health and safety. As a physician, I figure that's basically what I'm going to be speaking about. Some of my, my fellow um, neighbors will be talking about other topics. And again, uh, if you look at Chapter 69, Zoning, uh, zoning chapter, uh, chapter 2, the quality of life, once again, uh, it talks about public health and safety. The issues I'm going to talk about, again, as a physician, would be, and my, my specialty would be uh, lead, sound, crashes, and, and unobstructed uh, runway protection zone. I do also want to mention that there are uh, some pilots here today that unfortunately uh, did not have the best landings, uh, and they landed, one landed in a shopping center, another one landed uh, outside of our uh, aerodrome, and there wasn't a, a place for them both to land safely. The first thing I want to talk about is lead, okay? Aircrafts use something called 100 LL, which is high lead concentrated um, fuel. As far as lead goes, if you look at um, the RRP regulations, developers are not exempt from this regulation. Also, Chapter 25, Title 6 of the Delaware Code, sellers of residential property have the legal duty to disclose any known potential environmental hazards, including lead to buyers. Um, these airplanes, as they take off, that's when we're in full power taking off, and that's when flying over twin mass, specifically in the air, airway uh, protection zone, there, there it will be a, head, a lead, uh, lead hazard. Now, as a neurologist and a pediatric neurologist, I've taken care of children with encephalopathy. I've taken care of children that have had lead intoxication, and you have to be able to chelate those children at a certain time. If you don't chelate them, they will have permanent brain damage. So if this... If this program is approved, I think one of the things that everyone should know is that they have to have the children tested for lead. And we Are you sure you want to state this on the record? Because it sounds like what you're stating is an admission of liability that you're polluting other people's property. Okay, so I'm just caution you about what okay. you seem to be stating I, I, I on the just, record this okay. evening. As far as what I'm saying, as far as what I'm saying, okay, on the record, is, and this is what hey, this hey, article. Hey, excuse me, just a second. And this Look, is what the article. No, stop, is about. stop. Be quiet. If you can't be quiet, you're going to go out of here. Now, this gentleman has the floor. I expect you to listen to him. Go ahead. Again, you know, as far as being a physician goes, I think that I. I, I would like it stated on the record. 
okay, because that's what I'm all about, and that's how I started this conversation. It's known that kids are being poisoned, and from, from again, when the plane takes off over certain areas, this is being known. In 2024, there's going to be mitigation against this, and I, I think the board should be aware of this. But again, I'm not hiding anything, and I want to be totally transparent here. I think there are issues here, okay, and I want to tell you what the issues are. And one of the issues are lead. And again, you know, as you said, uh, developing a subdivision in an area of lead only possesses a serious health to future inhabitants, but also raises substantial legal ethical concerns regarding disclosure of such hazards. It just seems like you ought to be disclosing that to every property owner that's you know, say, on either end of the runway yeah, already. What does it say about all the people that already live yeah. in proximity of the airport? Are you poisoning them? Is that no, what you're telling No, I'm them? saying that when the plane takes off, there's the exhaust that comes yeah, out. But that's going over, over other populated areas. I, mean, it's, I looked at the maps, and it's not going over other populated areas. Is it okay. going over this subdivision? It's going, again, if we have a runway protective zone, that's the area that's going to be affected by this. There are homes that are in that yeah, today, right? There are houses yeah. that are yeah. near that airport. Yeah, don't tell me there's no houses near that airport. There are. When you this say near a, the this airport. This is a grave concern here. I had no idea that, was, that, that, that type of thing was happening. When you say that there are houses near the airport, Okay, again, um, th that, those issues are being mitigated at this point. It's being taken up by our homeowners association, and it's also being taken up by different aviation consultants. This is something that, again, we're aware of. And, and, and again, if there's going to be houses specifically in the, or, or people, pickleball courts, car, car, cars are going to be parked there, whatever he's going to put in that area, I, I need to make you aware that I'm concerned about that. Okay, all right. Well, you have. You certainly made us aware. Okay. Should the Hudsons be operating, you know, concerts on that field and, yeah, um, you know, the that. Christmas tree farm and everything else, if that's the case? Again, as far as them operating concerts on the field, the concerts are not in the, in, in the runway area because when the, when, the, when the area where this is a problem is the area where the, patient, where the plane is in maximum throttle taking off. That's, and that's, ex that's exactly where twin, twin mass is going to be. Okay. That's the area of the problem. Now, again, uh, uh, the consultant never even discussed that, and I would have hoped he would have come to us, and we probably could have sat down and discussed these things. So you have all the information you need to make the right decision. That's what I'm about. Okay, okay. also, uh, just to mention, that um, next, next slide, um, I want to talk about sound, sound issues which were brought up as well, okay? Uh, if you looked at our, uh, the Twin Mass consultant, he said the sound of, a, of an aircraft is like being in a rock concert. When I go to a rock concert, I put cotton in my ears because I have to put a stethoscope in my ears. I have to listen to, heart, to hearts because my ears are very sensitive. So as far as... Um, Sound goes, I'll have another member of our board talk about that. Uh, but sound, especially, I don't know if you've been under an, air, an airplane going uh, approximately seven feet, 70 feet. I think he, he said that that's what it's going to be. Uh, sound produces a physical res a, a, a autonomic response, I call it, which is called a physical stress response. It can produce uh, sleep disturbance, stress hormones can be secreted, and uh, increases heart rate, blood pressure. There was a study done by Dr. Laura at Colorado University, and she looked at uh, approximately 10 years of infants that was uh, exposed to uh, that lived outside an airport in, a, in those areas where the Delta consultant said that there are airplanes taking off, such as the Newcastle. She looked specifically in, in, in runway protective zone. The results showed that 20% of newborns were underweight and dangers of being raped. There was also, also I want to mention that as far as uh, animal studies that were done, if you take an animal at birth and you cover their eyes and you leave those eyes covered and they miss the crucial time of development for vision to develop and you take the blindfold off after that time, those infants will be permanently impaired. They will not be able to see. They will be blind. So as far as noise goes, the way it affects infants, again, 
in the run, in, in the takeoff pattern, if there's going to be infants in this development, I think it's important, as you said, to let people know. This can produce significant hearing loss and hearing damage to infants as well as other people in that area. The other thing I'm concerned about is that uh, there's been studies that show children with developmental disabilities, specifically autism, are very, very sensitive to hearing. They, get, uh, they have a sensory input deficiency where when they get overstimulated, it definitely affects them. I'm concerned about these people that have hearing issues being in the, uh, in the area of the run rate protective zone. There's going to be uh, another, uh, there's going to be uh, Janet here uh, who will be talking about uh, crashes. Her husband's a pilot, she's a stewardess, and I I'm going to try to uh, leave, leave this to her. Now, uh, one of the things I, I just want to mention is a lot of times we talked about a standard development, okay? I don't think this is a standard development. Okay, and I'm happy you brought up two entrances because I can't imagine if a plane crashes, okay, and we have to bring in ambulances, and who knows what's going to happen in that development. I can't imagine one entrance being, being okay. I have an issue with that, okay? So we're going to have to make sure that we protect the public, we make sure there's an ent entrances, that if something does happen, uh, I'm, I'm a new flyer. If anyone's going to crash, it's going to be me. So I just need to let you know I need to make sure that EMS can get in and get out, fire. Uh, it, I just have to make sure that uh, that's, uh, this is not a standard development. We have an airport less than a half a mile away from these homes. It's not a standard development. And I just want to mention in my in my business, when I do something and make a wrong choice, it's called malpractice. If you guys make the wrong choice here, it's going to be called a catastrophe. Um, one of my other uh, members of the board will be talking about the airway protective zone, so I'll leave that up to them. And I just want to let you know that the head of the National Safety Commission uh, said that uh, every, every accident is preventable and it only takes one accident before anyone starts pointing fingers. There is a higher purpose of Eagle Crest. Uh, first of all, as you mentioned, uh, medical care coming in and out of there. I can tell you that, um, I can tell you stories. I don't know how much time you have, but I'd like, if you want, I can tell you stories. But stories. the bottom line, I understand. That's what I'm not gonna, uh, The bottom line is uh, medical care also. Uh, the airport does allow safety of relieving air traffic from Georgetown. Student pilots learning to fly at Eagle Crest. We also have Young Eagles, which is an all guys program with the EEA. And the United States Air Force Auxiliary Patrol member does some training and practice there. So um, as far as being uh, uh, the solution, I'm always, I always say we have to be part of a solution, not part of the problem. Uh, we did meet the developer and several times. And I felt that uh, we did come very close to making an agreement. However, what became unacceptable is to have, again, obstructions in the first 1,000 feet, such as a pump house, uh, having parking a lot in the middle of, uh, of a place where, in case there's an emergency and we have to land is a problem, having pickleball courts there. You know, so so the, those kind of things were were problems that we had as far as protecting our pilots and protecting the people on the ground. Any questions? Just one. Um, you, you did a good job of telling us how the airport would impact this development. Tell us how this, this, this development will have a negative impact on the airport or the surrounding folks there. How, how, how is, what's, what's the detriment going to be? What's the decrement going to be? What's, 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 why is this develop? What, what's the impact, negative impact, going to be of this development? Okay. Well, the first impact is going to be is what I mentioned: the medical reasons between uh, lead crashes. Oh, no, that's you impacting them. Oh, You're, how are they going to impact yeah, on how us? How do they impact? Yeah. How, the, how, how will the development impact negatively impact? Uh, okay. You know, why, so, you know, why should it not be there? Okay. So one of the things I can tell you is that you're going to have uh, 249 <coughs> houses there. Uh, 
we probably can assume there might be between 750 and 1,000 people. Uh, I can tell you that there's been times that um, people have asked uh, airports to please use the runway going in the other direction because they don't want the noise over their house. So I, I'm pretty sure that, and we can't do that because we, we have, the wind can, tells us which way to fly. It's all about the wind. So one of the issues would be, uh, again, you're going to get a lot of complaints. You know, and we want to avoid that because eventually you're going to get sick and tired of getting complaints, and that's going to have an impact on us. Okay? The other impact that the, uh, the development is going to have, again, we have people living on Hudson Road, and I didn't want to go into the traffic issues, but I have to tell you that um, there's going to be a lot of traffic. Again, I, I calculated about 2,400 2, trips out of that uh, one uh, area. Uh, I go down Round Bridge Pole Road. I love that road. There's uh, llamas on the road. There's kangaroos on that. You know, the place has uh, kangaroos there. There's uh, all different animals. I go to the nature reserve there. I love it. I love it. It's, it's still, and there's also a nature reserve there. So as far as it impacting me, uh, I know for sure that road's not going to be the same as it was, as, as a lot of Sussex County. Is, the road is going to change. Um, so I think, I think, again, as far as the residents go, uh, I, I welcome cluster developments. I, I don't have a problem with that. I just think this is a different cluster development. Than, and I think you can't put the same rules and regulations and policies and procedures on this cluster development as you use in other cluster developments. So, and again, as far as that goes, you know, uh, um, we, we, we want to be good neighbors, and it's going to be hard for us to, to, to have that relationship with this, with this uh, development. I don't know if uh, last time you had a plane fly over, uh, over close proximity, but again, based on the things we mentioned, it's going to have an impact on us also because I'm not sure how good neighbors we're going to be. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. I think the – I'm sorry, what? You all right? Oh, you. oh, okay. And the lady over here. Yes, ma'am. So I'm um, – Hold on, you got, you got to get up here and give us your name first because the World Wide Web machine wants to pick you up on that microphone. Hi. Okay. This is my stuff, right? You're going to pull it up, Mr. Whitehouse? Hi, I'm Janet Lady Gavel. I'm presenting for um, myself and three others that cannot be here tonight. Okay. Good evening, Commission, Mr. Whitehouse, staff, especially Ashley, who helped me with all of my uh, photos and videos. I'm going to give you my reasons for why you should deny twin masts. <laughs> Okay, so it's probably those first five photos. Okay, or the videos, yeah. So I was going to speak first and then show all the videos after. I want to okay. do it. It's your, it's your time. Okay. Okay, so first off, I'm citing code 99-4. The word shall is always mandatory. The word may is permissive. I'm a little confused on the service road because Steve Bayer from Del Dot, I don't think he answered that, road, that answer clearly. In the packet from Pamela Steinbach of Del Dot says that there will be a service road through that parcel. And I have a photo of that, and it would take out about 14 lots. And he never really gave an answer whether the service road was going to go through the parcel or not go through the parcel. The object ID number for that service road is 2309. I believe there's going to be a service road. Oh, that's, no, that's here. Oh, that's here. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 someone asked that, him, and I don't know if Mr. Bayer answered. And I, I called Mr. Bayer twice. I never got a call back. Um, I asked the question about an emergency access road. Yeah, no, the service road connecting those seven, eight businesses on Route 1 because – Oh, I believe, I believe the testimony was that they determined that that was not going to be feasible. Okay. I thought that's what was said. 
okay, can the commission get that in writing? Because if you approve this on one person's verbal statement that, oh, there's not going to be a service road in there, when in the packet, in the information, Del Dot shows that there is going to be a service road through that parcel. Well, and the, okay. the other issue is that if ultimately if Del Dot says there's going to be a service road, they're going to extract that prior to final site plan approval. But it would negate this site plan, well, is what I'm would, saying. It, it would potentially negate would, lots within the subdivision site yeah. plan. Okay. Yeah. All right. It would alter it significantly, that's okay. for sure. Yeah. So I have a couple of decades' experience in aviation, and an aircraft can land on any open surface where there's no obstruction. And I'm just going to mention the miracle on the Hudson, which wasn't a miracle because it was expertise of the pilot. He had a choice. He, did, he couldn't turn and go back to LaGuardia. He couldn't land into a building in New York City. He landed, it's called a planned ditching in aviation. He landed in the Hudson River and all souls were saved. So having um, homes in the restrictive flight zone, when a pilot has to land a plane, they have to land in an open space. They may not be high enough to turn around and go and land at the field. They have to land at, on an open field. So I think having homes in that 2000 strip or pickleball court or pump house or parking lot is irresponsible. The traffic study, as um, Ms. Muthab has stated, was pieced together. And I don't understand how that could be accurate. The traffic study needs to be concrete, not pieced together by other pieces of the puzzle here, okay? Del Dot did not take into consideration the four lots that have been approved on Round Pole Bridge Road, that's Lock Haven, in front of Lock Haven. The two that were approved tonight, Mrs. Joan Reed, and also the 19 that um, Mr. Lockwood has an application in for, but no hearing date yet. Round Pole Bridge Road is a local farm road in state level four, where the state recommends preserving farmland, woodlands, and the state of Delaware not put any money into the infrastructure to fix the roads. So we're stuck with the same road. And when you ask the Del Dot representative, Ms. Ms. Thob, um, Mr. Collins asked her, well, what's gonna happen to the rest of Brown Pole? She went back to the developers going to fix in front of the development and that's all. So I will tell you, I work north, and when that um, crossover is closed, um, to be able to go north on Hudson, I will take Round Pole and go through Milton to get on Route 1 rather than to go south on Eagle Crest or, or Cave Neck. And a lot more people will be doing that as well. Another reason to deny. Um, also, in the, in the um, Code 99.3, it says, um, this chapter is established to promote the, and protect the healthy, safety, convenience, orderly growth and welfare of the citizens of the county to assist in the proper development, conservation, and property values of use of land in the county and to encourage conservation of farmland. I'm concerned with property values, and I know you don't like to get into this, Mr. Wheatley, but if this is going to be a cookie-cutter development, I'd like to know uh, the median average, and it's all in my documents, the median price for a home that sold within the last six months was 660,000. Um, and most of those are on an one acre or above. So I'm just, I'm hoping that this is not a cookie cutter development that will be $399,000 homes, bringing the value of all the property values down in that area. Um, accidents happen weekly in the summer. I have a video that shows you um, at least twice every weekend there are accidents and I sit on my front porch and I count and when Route 1 is backed up they go around Pole Bridge Road and they go through Milton to get to 16 to go north. Um, I counted, I didn't count for an hour, I counted 13 cars in a minute, that's 780 cars in one hour and normally it takes at least two hours to clean up an accident. So that wasn't even taken into consideration in a traffic study. From Memorial Day to Labor Day, there's an accident every weekend going north, and everybody cuts through Round Pole. 
or they'll go Cave Neck, depending on if the accident is south of Cave Neck or if it's at Hudson there. Homes backing up to Route 1. I walked the back line of the property um, behind the church on Route 1. The noise is so loud from the traffic. I live a mile from Route 1, and I can hear the trucks and the motorcycles. I can even hear the concerts at Hudson Fields from where I live. But this can't be superior design. If you have homes on that back strip, that will be, what did they say, um, a 40-foot buffer, and then the home is about, four, about 80 feet from Route 1. How can that be superior design? Nobody wants to buy a house with a highway in their backyard. One previous commissioner stated to me, she stated this is a terrible plan in a terrible area on a terrible road. Um, even the developer's exit, Jim Erickson stated that Milton is such a great place and everybody's going to want to go into the town of Milton and there's restaurant and there's shopping and there's dining. Well, he's even stating that everybody's going to want to go to Milton. Well, to get to Milton, they're going to take around Pole Bridge Road from this development to Cave Neck and make a right on Union Street, and there you are. You're in downtown Milton. Food Lion, Walgreens, liquor store, dentist office, doctor's offices. The schools are Milton Elementary, H.O. Brittingham, Mariner Middle School, Sussex Tech, Dell Tech, Wilmington College. To get here tonight, I took Round Pole Bridge Road because it's the quickest way to get to Georgetown. So they can have all their statistics. I live there. And there are the residents here that live there as well that will tell you. I don't understand why the developer paid in full and didn't wait to get preliminary approval like a lot of subdivisions. It seems like they know this is going to get approved. I wouldn't spend $6.5 I wouldn't probably spend 500000 unless I knew I had a sure thing. Active hunting range, which my neighbor will talk about tonight. Um, so, commissioners, I'm asking you, please make a logical decision. You have a logical decision to make if this fits in with county code. Not does it check all the boxes. Does this development in, on this terrible road, in this location with this terrible traffic on an airport, is this a logical place to put 249 homes? And if you must approve this, I ask for a lot of conditions. Take out the homes in the floodplain. We see how the bridge floods. Take out all the homes in the Del Dot Service Road, if we know that's going to be there or not. Take out the homes in the 99-foot still shot area. Take out the lots in the 100-foot by 2,000-foot res res restricted flight zone. Demanding the developer to improve all two miles of Round Pole Bridge Road with 11-foot lanes and shoulders and a center line. Approved conditionally upon the seller's need to disclose the lead um, ex exhaust from the aircraft. Sellers need to disclose the decibel level in the flight zone. I will also ask the county to install bumps every third mile on Round Pole Bridge Road. So, back to this lead business. Mm -hmm. You were aware of that? You're aware of that? I'm aware that general aircraft aviation use a 100 LL, but I think what you you didn't understand, Dr. Shear. It it only it evaporates once you're, once you're at a certain altitude. It's only in the takeoff path where the exhaust comes out of this. And if you look at the takeoff path that actually even the developer had up, there's no homes over that. There's no homes over the runway. It goes across Marianne's. She's here, her field, and it goes across this field. So there aren't any homes currently in that takeoff path. Okay. Oh, I'm not a pilot, but you could ask the pilots. They know that. Um, so I asked for... Rather ask an engineer, but okay. <laughs> uh, they didn't mention it, so maybe they didn't want to mention it. Developer, I asked for the county or the developer to install speed bumps every third mile on Round Pole Bridge Road because that would really help um, eliminate all the through traffic when it becomes, you know, a hassle for them to cut through. Perhaps that they'll go Cave Neck instead, which is Cave Neck is stayed, paved up to county council. And I also ask that construction not start until 2028 or later when the Cave Neck interchange is done and the CCP is done because 
we really have too much traffic right now on Hudson Road to really get anywhere. It's dangerous. Keep in mind, Round Pole Bridge Road floods, the curves in the road, there's ter terrible visibility, and traffic backs up from Hudson Road down to Cave Neck and you can't get out. So I have some pictures here. This is one of the curves in Round Pole, and if you look, that's my neighbor's house who is here. Um, the, his driveway is paved better than the road. <laughs> that's the condition of the road, okay? And again, same house. His driveway is paved better than Round Pole Bridge Road. Okay, Round Pole Bridge Road is nothing more than really a driveway. Another curve in the road. There's the corn, the curves, the curves. And on this uh, site plan, the light blue line is the proposed Del Dot access road, but I don't think you want to see that because you think that it won't be there, right? What they testified to, but, okay. you know, Do you want me to point that out to you so you can see it? It's up to you. It's your, it's your presentation. These businesses on Route 1, and this is the service road that will connect these businesses and goes right through the parcel, right through one of the storm retention ponds. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's in the packet. Yeah. You have to find it, but it's in there, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so how do, can we go to videos now? Sure. Please. <laughs> and if you have volume, you may want to turn it down because I was driving and had some loud music playing. Of, of course, it's around Pole Bridge Road. There's nobody. There you go. Oh, oh, wait, wait, what, what were you going to say? There's yeah, no there's traffic. traffic. There's no traffic. Yeah. Oh, oh, interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Apparently, there is no traffic on Brown Pole Bridge Road. Yeah, can you enlarge that? Okay. Okay, here we are going around a curve. How fast were you going when you were taking 45. <laughs> the speed limit's 50. <laughs> It's not posted, it's 50. We all know that. Okay, there's one more video with, um, this is actually, um, this is Steamboat Landing Road with the combines when they cut the corn uh, and you gotta pull over because you can't fit. And you gotta wait. Never hurt you. And that um, happens seasonally. You gotta pull over because farm trucks are coming, so. And you just wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. What do you think the solution to that problem should be? I would like Del Dot to improve the road. So you'd like the road to be 50 feet wide so that a combine can get down there three times a year. I would like the road to be up to state standards. It is up to state yeah, standards. State standards. Yeah, with, the t with 11 foot lanes and, and shoulders. And this is going north. Um, when the sun is setting and you can see the glare and you're going around the corn crops and you can, can't see around the curves. And here's another curve and you can't see oncoming traffic if you're both going 45 miles an hour. And you can see the corn. And there's another curve, and you're going around the bend, and you can't see the oncoming traffic because you're going 40 miles an hour. Has any commissioner not been on the road? We've all been on the road. Okay. Yeah. On the well, road. just for public record. We have seven more hearings. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. I did add all of my conditions. I'm presenting for three more. If you would like me to take a seat and come up back individually. One trip to a customer and okay. go ahead and summarize what you have left, if you would, please. That's all for my presentation. I'm presenting for three others that cannot be here and they can't call in because call-ins are not allowed. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm presenting on behalf of Heather Kingry, who presented at the last Twin Mass meeting. You may remember her. You thought that she did a plot plan, but she didn't. Okay. Um, I also, yeah, there we go. So... Heather lives in Georgetown and grew up in Western Sussex. She has lived on Ron Pole Bridge Road, and her mother still resides there. 
She's very familiar with the road, the character of the area, and the traffic patterns. Good afternoon, Commissioners. When I looked closely through the new application, I was disappointed that the new plan is so similar to the previous one. You saw the turnout in opposition of this previous proposal in March. I have print, a printout of how similar the two plans are just to show you that it was then and still is a misrepresentation of the intention of the cluster development code and process. This time around, the developer seems to pat themselves on the back for the gener generous buffer excess excessive contiguous space and preservation of trees. They repeatedly note that you are still allowed to remove and develop over excellent ground water recharge areas, et cetera. But just as it was with the previous proposal, this proposal is not viable for this location and needs to be denied. Across all documents from the PLUS report to your own code, the comprehensive land use plan to previous P&Z decisions on this same exact road, across all of these documents, I find the same efforts to develop in a way that is mindful of the environment and cautious to minimize harmful impacts. This code and intent is not being acknowledged by the developer. I don't have time to speak to all the numerous references to these documents, but as you know, all of these documents support the preserv preservation of environmentally sensitive areas and the protection of natural resources. And all of these documents speak to the fact that this application should be denied. I'd like to bring awareness to the cluster development. My understanding from your code is the purpose of the cluster subdivision is to allow many homes to be crammed into a small area in order to protect the beneficial natural resources of the property. The developer seems to think that only the first natural resources being the wetlands needs to be preserved and then they don't need to worry about the secondary natural resources. According to your code 115-25, section 3A, the cluster development sketch plan and the preliminary plan on the cluster subdivision provides for total environment and design which are superior in the reasonable judgment of the planning commission. Section 115-25-3A1, homes shall be clustered on the environmentally suitable portions of the track specifically those portions of the track least encumbered by sensitive environmental features, including but not limited to wetlands, mature woodlands, waterways, and other water bodies. Your code clearly says the cluster development plan will preserve the natural environment and any historic or archaeological resources, section 115.25-9b. Furthermore, code 115-25 Section 6 clearly states, removal of healthy mature trees shall be limited and 115-25-7, the scenic views that can be seen from within the track should be preserved to the greatest extent possible. The further, this is further reinforced in the comp plan. According to the comp plan, cluster development permits de developers to deviate from the norm in order to create permanent preservation of the percentage of land. This de design deviates by cramming in many more homes than permitted in a standard subdivision, but it does not preserve. It does the opposite of preservation with clear cutting, mature woods, and excellent groundwater recharge area and building on flood plans. In previous hearing, the developer's attorney said the public is aware that many clustered developments have been approved. That may be the case, but maybe they followed the process and code and they have not been approved here on this road. On this road, much smaller developments have been denied. The very first step of a developer's plan is outlined in your code, 115 section 25.8a, is to identify lands that should be preserved. First, areas worthy of preservation should be mapped, including wetlands, wooded areas, waterways, and other water bodies, and natural drainage areas. Then, other features that are important should be mapped, such as trees, lines, water views, historic buildings, and prime farmland. The areas with the fewest important natural, scenic, and historic features should be considered the potential development area. And that is why cluster developments are allowed. It is allowed to cram many more homes into un a uh, the usual space in order to preserve lands that should be preserved. I'm going to ask you to summarize in about 50 words whatever's left in that document because I think we've got the gist of the. Okay. If you, the, and, if you look at the if you look at the graphics there. Mm -hmm. And you may certainly, and I encourage you to submit that document for the record so that we can put the written the written. Okay, document. it's from Heather Kingry, so I will submit and, it. Yeah, that's great. If you so can, you her graph it. shows um, the potential development area which would be in between the two black lines because the other black lines are the mature trees and woodlands. And there's one more. Okay. There's one more video, one more photo. 
I mean, I, I, you know, I appreciate the thoroughness with which she prepared her document, but please bear in mind that, you know, we're pretty familiar with chapter and verse. We live with this code all the time. You don't really have to, to quote it back to us. But so she's showing you here um, the title place. area again, and then the area in the center would be the developable right. part, and there's one more. Okay. And that's it for Heather. Um, there is another PowerPoint from... Um, my other neighbor, Sarah Esposito, who is a Dell Dot engineer, she is representing as herself, not as an employee of Dell Dot. And that's it. Okay. There's 21 slides. All right, well, I'm going to ask you to zip through them pretty, pretty smartly, but go ahead. This, 249 homes is a 600% increase of traffic on Ron Polbridge Road, okay? Traffic on Ron Polbridge Road will have an 800% increase. The Meadows of Beaver Creek was denied by this commission for 56 homes on 56 acres. Lock Haven was denied by this commission because of Ron Polbridge Road in 2021 because one of the reasons was because of Round Pole Bridge Road. So there's already a precedent set. Well, it, yeah. There's already a precedent set that Round Pole Bridge Road can't handle the traffic, okay? And then Sarah goes on to state a lot of the building that would occur in the wetlands. Mm -hmm. Here you see the picture of the flooded bridge. I drove home Saturday night, the bridge was flooded again. Um, farm trucks, Lock Haven, she's quoting why there was a denial because of the road. So there's a precedent set. And she has her own data of the Del Dot daily trips because she is a PE for Del Dot. And I can't further, here we go. Okay, she's stating here that they're going to take Round Pole Bridge Road to go to the town of Milton. She did it. Um, She did a, um, a Google um, map. Um, she disagrees with the, that it's a superior site plan. Again, she's stating Lock Haven, which backs up to the Beaver Dam Creek. She's asking for a secondary. Um, she said Del Dot can not deny an entrance. Planning and zoning can. She's showing here on all of these where uh, trees are cleared in the floodplain. Okay, so my last presentation is. So just before, just so we're clear, that will be part of the record and we'll make sure that's uploaded. It's, the it's there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I thought it was. Well, I mean, yeah. it's, in, it's in the record. I don't want you to think we're. we're, we're no, we're, it's in the record. Right, everything's in the record, yeah. Okay, I'm going to speak now for Dennis Letty Gavel. Uh, he is working. Um, hello, I wanted to write you regarding my opposition to twin masks. I think it should be nine due to these reasons. Round Pole Bridge Road is too narrow. It is a single lane road, lacks forward visibility in the corner due to high cornfield that make it impossible to see oncoming traffic. Two, Hudson Fields Airport. Even though I've been able to make the meeting, my wife will make presentation for me. Yep, you have that up there. I'm a captain at a major airline. I have 23,000 hours of flight time, 30 years experience in aviation, and work with the FAA on safety issues. I think putting a cluster development in the takeoff path of a general aviation airport is irresponsible. Most of the planes that take off from Hudson Fields are single engines, general aviation aircraft. In case of engine failure after takeoff, the only option is to land straight ahead, preferably in an open field, not a cluster development. Engine failure on general aviation air, airplanes is pre, pretty fairly common. Although general aviation only make up less than 1% of the flying of commercial, of all flying, um, general aviation aircraft make up 80% of the accidents. A quick look at the NTSB database for August 2023 shows 92 general aviation accidents in the USA. The state recommends against building a level four. I agree. Thank you, Captain Dennis Ledigel. And then he has compiled um, a, a look back just 
random photos of the last 10 years with aircraft that have crashed into homes. And they had no other option because there was no other place to land. So keep that in mind if you approve this. If an aircraft needs to, the critical phase of flight are the first three minutes of flight. That's what we call the critical phase of flight. That's when engine failure happens. So um, if they are taking off and they, they may not be high enough to turn around and go back to the field, they have to come down. And there will be pilots here that will talk about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Um, we'll take this guy all the way in the back, and then you can be next, and then, Mr. King, you can be next, okay? There we go. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Brian Reed. I've lived on this road for 43 years, and I'm probably going to be one of the one of two people that's probably mostly or mainly impacted by this development. Okay. Um, besides the airport, um, first I want to address uh, just one point that my neighbor, Miss Janet, Mrs. Janet, had just said in her last video of going around that cornfield. Yep. That one cor that one corner, I was going around. And there was a combine, and I had to go off, like drive off into the grass because it almost hit me because it couldn't see me, and I couldn't see it. And you've lived on that road for 43 years? 43 years. And for 43 years, combines have been going down that road every I was day. already riding on the side of the road predicting it, <laughs> predicting it. I, I, I and it's, it wasn't even on their grass. It was on my side. Well, maybe he was in the wrong place. I'm sorry that that happened. So I just want to make the commission aware of that. Um, the other thing, I made some notes here. Um, so I heard a few numbers for acreage for this plot plan um, from Mr. Lene and the civil engineer of this. It's 44.13 acres, which is square footage essentially, but 80 feet up to 100 foot bu buffer as a straight line or as a straight shot, as it were, in a case from my marshland, which is 25 acres, that butts up and is adjacent to this plot plan. As you can see, and I've outlined the green area. Like, this is all mine, 25 acres. Depending on where the boat or a duck blind sits on this, this is where the shot's going to travel, and this is going to mitigate these homes here and possibly into where the red is, as I said, where the duck line or the boat is. So I've heard some certain buffer zones of up to 50, you know, that's the minimum that's required. That's not going to allow for what I have prepared here. The impact of wetlands by development and encroachment that the Beaver Dam Creek is utilized by trappers and duck hunters and a steel shot used in duck hunting can travel. And as I stated, I'm an owner of these wetlands adjacent to this farmland, and I rent this property, and this would be detrimental and significantly impact and hurt my livelihood as I currently retain an income. As I have operated a business, which is Reed's LLC, before this uh, development of this farmland. As my counterpart, the um, airport has stated, they have been here before this development as well as me. Um, Future residents are not permitted to discharge firearms within 100 yards, which is 300 feet, in an occupied dwelling or building to hunt or remove nuisance wildlife. With a 300-foot safety zone recommended between proposed housing and wildlife habitat, a significant portion of the western side of the parcel is located within a state natural areas designation, Broad Kill River Natural Area. Natural areas contain lands of statewide significance identified by the state air by the natural areas advisory council as the highest quality and most important natural lands remaining in Delaware. Steel gunshot travels over 990 feet. That hunters are not permitted to shoot across public roads, that there will be a loss of hunting privileges in the area, a 50-foot buffer, and this is going um, by what I've heard and 
previous uh, submissions of this development. A 50-foot buffer was proposed in 2007, which is not enough for still gunshot duck hunting purposes. This is a level four area and it should not be de um, developed. Um, I asked for denial of this development um, and at least a thousand foot buffer zone because steel three at threes will travel at 1500 feet per second and will penetrate skin to 143 yards. If you do the math on that, that's roughly 400 and 39 feet and travel 715 feet. Steel BBs travels over 990 feet and will penetrate the skin to 182 yards, which is approximately or 546 feet and travel 880 feet. I ask that there be, like I said, over a thousand foot buffer zone because of this and a 10 foot privacy fence at the very least to be installed by the developers if it's approved because um, based on this drawing plan over here where a round pole is located, right across here is a field and in that field right across there, well not in the field but right next to it, is a recent development within the last 10 years and I've seen people literally cross walking, about 10 of them, right through the field to get to their development instead of going down round pole to hit Hudson to get over to their development. So. The last thing that I heard, um, the engineer stated that they were scenic views. I'm wondering what scenic views they're speaking of because if they're talking about the wetlands and the marshlands, that's my scenic views. And if that's being put like as a sales pitch for the future residents of this area, they're going to be wanting to look at my marshland or wetlands and that what's to prevent them from trespassing over there. And you're going to have a lot of residents that are irritated and mad because if I find trespassers on my land, I'm calling the police and it's just going to be an ongoing problem. Um, also, uh, what I wanted to also was to say that if you approve this subdivision, this is my last thing I would like to say, if you approve this subdivision and or these particular or this section of homes, you will take my property rights away and or for hunting. I don't know how you will judge, choose, or weigh one's property rights over another, but I am an LLC, and he is an LLC, and we both are in business to take to make money. The difference is I was here first, and my LLC was here first. It was established first. So if P&Z decides to go with this subdivision, that would be unfair to me as a landowner and an LLC and my way of life that would take away part of my livelihood. If PNC decides to prove twin mass, I ask for a, like I said, a thousand foot buffer because steel shot travels 990 feet so I can continue my livelihood and it and my LLC won't suffer a burden or hardship that will have been made possible um, by the approval of this plan by PNC that was placed upon me. Also, I asked for, like I said, a 10 foot privacy fence, the full length line of the my 25 acres marsh to prevent future residents from trespassing and or littering or my property and poisoning the tidal water and animal life habitat. Because as such, as this plant plot plan says, and Mr. Lene and an engineer pointed out, here's all the vegetation and the tree growth. They're saying that's a buffer, that's square footage. That's not the buffer line. It's not like a 10 foot that's going to prevent people from coming over here and looking at the wetlands and the marsh. We have fishermen that are always on the bridge fishing and they've been seen off the bridge in other places that they should not be as well. So I've proposed, like I said, a fence there to protect my livelihood and the safety of the residents that are going to go in here because this tree line is not going to prevent them and it's not going to prevent them from leaving trash and then other litter there. I have a question for you. You're talking about your livelihood. Are you a hunting guide? Am I a hunting guide? Guide. No. No, I rent this land out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Step right up. <coughs>
This should be online. <coughs> Which file was it, sir? Which file is it, sir? I put it in four frames. Sure. It's his zip drive. <coughs> Before you start the departure, hi, my name is Robert Massone. I was president of a zoning board of appeals for several years, and I'd, I'd like to think I was one-tenth as attentive, as polite, and as cordial as you all are, but I don't think I could shine your shoes. I, I'm just shocked at this group for a second time, because I was at a previous hearing, and you it's the same. So thank you, you know, for doing what you're doing. Um, the first topic, can I dabble with this lead? There was an error on Dr. Shear's slide. He had 100 LL, and then it said high lead. Well, it means the opposite. It's 100 low lead. It used to be just 100. I started flying in the 80s, um, and, uh, and it was uh, considered a hazard, a health hazard. So a level of lead that was... Uh, health safe, but still allowed valves in the engines to seal and give the proper power to the aircraft engines was achieved. And that has been the standard now for two or three decades. There is, it is only a concern um, for some extreme environmentalists who don't want any lead on any land, and there has been a move to get substitute fuels. In fact, one has just come to market maybe this year or early last year, and is now just being distributed. So by the end of this decade, there probably will be 100 UL, unleaded. Dr. Shears is a neurologist. When he hears lead, you know, this is his field. So, but, but I think he was mistaken about the lead on that slide. Well, I'm glad to hear you're getting the lead out. You're getting the lead. <laughs> How do you people do it? I'm going to encourage you to keep doing it. You that. are here for hours. How do you do it? <laughs> so... We have, we have seven more yeah. public hearings today, believe it or not. I'm going to be brief, and I'm going to keep it as new as I can. Thank you. Yeah, um, right, but make your case. So, make your case. So I am a flight instructor. <laughs> That's not my profession, but I'm a flight instructor. I'm a commercial pilot. I have several thousand hours in about 50 different aircraft. I have a jet-type rating. Um, as an aside, I was on vacation in Knoxville, and I flew back. Just for this, just for this meeting. Um, but in any event, um, and I was president. I was on a board, an airport board, and I was president of board for almost two decades, Fairfield County, Ohio. And I've used consultants like Mr. Lamb, and they're very helpful with the data and the legalities and drawing up contracts. But the bottom line was mine: the safety of the airport and the safety of the people around the airport. And that's. That's what I'm talking about now. So if we could start this video. This is my helicopter, which burns jet fuel. <laughs> has no lead in it. <laughs> and we're taking off. And um, this is still on the runway. And if you could stop it for a second. So Mr. Lamb spoke about, oh, a three-degree glide slope, and it could be four-degree glide. You know what? When you're taking off, you don't know what that slope's going to be. Because on a hot August day, I have full fuel, and I have four passengers with me, I will barely get a one-degree glide slope. And then if I lose that engine, I can already be over Hudson, Hudson Road. Now, on a, hot, on a cool October day, I have half fuel, and I'm flying to go pick up my nephew in Ocean City. Oh, yeah, I'll have a four or five degree. It'll really climb. So this is unpredictable. It's not as, as arithmetic as, as he stated. If you can continue the video. So I'm about 100 feet in the air here, and you can stop the video here. So the parcel is in view right here. So I'm about 100 feet in the air. Um, I have full fuel, 100 gallons, 98 gallons of jet fuel. My other plane is an antique 1940 biplane. It holds 50 gallons of 100 low lead. And so the other day I was landing in the Waco. It's called the Waco. Weaver Aircraft Company, and I looked at my rate of descent. It does a special landing. It's just a power-off swooping landing, and I was descending at over 1,400 feet a minute. 
And so at 100, quick calculation, at 1,400 feet per minute, that's 23 feet down per second. And I'm going 100 miles an hour, so that's 146 feet forward. The time, at 23 feet per second, the time would be four seconds that I have, okay? Um, plus my reaction time of, say, three seconds, which is a standard calculated reaction time in all emergencies in aviation, okay? So seven seconds, I would have traveled almost 1,100 feet forward by the time I got to the ground, okay? So that puts me right in twin mass. And then I'm going to skid. And if I'm lucky and I skid straight, this will barely be a story. Barely be a story. Um, but, but this is what this is, this is about. Um, the, the safety right here. If we can have this runway protection zone, okay, the name's been changed uh, to uh, the limited development area or something like, like that. Nobody wants to call it runway protection zone, but it's for protection. <laughs> I did buy, Mr. Lamb said nobody really buys the land. As the airport board president, I did buy uh, 2,000 feet to make a runway protection zone because it was uh, the only way I could get grant money was if I met this runway protection zone. It was, a, it was a public airport. And don't you think after I had it all plowed nicely and seeded and it was growing in the third year, this is an aside, the city comes to me. It's public land. It's, own, it's in the name of the county. And they say, Hey, we have great plans. They come to one of my board meetings. Oh, what do, what do I owe this place to do? We want to put a soccer field there. We love that field. And I go, are you serious? They were serious. I had to get AOPA involved, and I had to get the FAA involved to stop this soccer field. So, you know, no, nobody wants unused land. You know, you know um, so in any event, <clears throat> I think that's all I need for the video. Here's another problem I had as an airport board member. So safety, this is, this is real. This is real. Uh, initially, there were six homes in this runway protective zone to be. I am not on the board. I live at Eagle Crest. I am not on the board, but I was invited to the meetings. And I had several meetings with, if I can call him Hal, okay, um, with Hal. And, um, and so, and he was on, on it. Right after the first meeting, he was on it. He called us. He wanted to meet right away back in early April after the March thing. I'm like, oh, this is a great sign. Okay? So we tell him what we want, a runway protective zone, the easement so nothing grows, and uh, the deed notifications. I, w I went through all of this with other developments in, in, back in Ohio. And he was, said, okay, no, nah, no, nah, nah. And then he comes back with a new site plan. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, what is this in the runway protective zone? He goes, well, that's a pickleball court. I go, where's the pickleball court on the first plan? He goes, well, there wasn't any. And I'm like going, is he taking us seriously? He's redoing the plan, but he's adding a pickleball court? Is it okay if somebody gets hurt, killed on a pickleball court instead of their bedroom? So, so I know Mackenzie, you know, said we were demonizing Hal, and he was negotiating good faith, but he, but he really wasn't. We spent... Uh, several thousand dollars to have our lawyers draw up what contained P, Q, and R, those paragraphs, and we sent them to McKenzie. We heard nothing. It was at least six weeks. It was probably two months. Then we had to pay our attorneys to query McKenzie. Got no answer. Query Hal. And even our attorneys going, well, you know, this is probably not the only thing on Hal's plate. You know, well, I know, but two months went by after we took the initiative to help get this settled. So, so we wouldn't have this. We were hoping to avert this, but we couldn't. We were, we were never getting anything substantial. I've done a lot of negotiations with hospitals, you know, uh, insurance companies, surgery centers, uh, merger and acquisition. I know when somebody's negotiating good faith, and I really don't think Hal was. I think he was trying to find out what our thoughts were so he could get experts to put up numbers or something like that. Another issue I had as an airport president, board president was noise, okay? So I invested in a decibel meter and there was particularly one farmer who was on what we call a downwind leg where you're getting ready to land, you're throttled back and you kind of, and he was complaining of noise. And I'm like going, how could, it's not even the takeoff. How could he be? So we, we go to his place and somebody's going to fly a typical airplane, a Cessna 172 down. And while we're talking, normal decibel levels, 
for most people, not me. I spent the first six years of my marriage telling my wife I wasn't yelling at her. I'm Italian. But for most people, the conversation level is about 72 decibels. We're talking in this field and we're hitting 72 decibels. As the plane comes, we got perfectly quiet. And you know what it was when it went over? 72 decibels. But he perceived that as loud and as a nuisance. The diagram, I've run the noise diagrams, plumes, you know, and I did it for existing traffic, including all our jet traffic, and 10 years worth of growth. And it never reached this development to be EPA prohibitive or dangerous. So we did put deed notifications in that said, the noise you hear will be maybe annoying to you, but it will not be unsafe according to EPA standards. So Mr. Lamb's talking probably about EPA safety standards, and I'm not. I'm talking about neighbor, neighbors and, and, and protests. Now, the development I looked at, I was dealing with, I think there were 3,000 homes, four people were home. That's 12,000 people. It was a town of 36,000, so I had like one-fourth of the population was going to live off the end of the runway. And I said, what are the odds of one of these people beginning a complaint? You know what I mean? And jeopardizing the, the life of the airport. So besides safety, my hat, the hat I also wore was the longevity uh, and usefulness of the airport, which is one of my, my things here. So the irony is, don't you think 10 years later, I'm living in one of those homes? And I'm talking to my neighbor, and a plane flies over. And I said, hey, does that bother you? He goes, no, we love it. So I did my best to protect the airport. No complaints ever really happened. But, but to put a deed notification doesn't cost Hal anything, OK? To, to um, what was the other thing, PQ and R, what are they? Uh, one, to, to, uh, uh, so when, when, let me backtrack. So the next plan, the pickleball court, I don't know if it was gone, but there were still two houses there. And there was now the meeting house in, the, in the, what we wanted was the RPZ. So again, I'm saying, is Hal really negotiating with this? Maybe not. And so I said to Hal, how about these two? You moved four houses, but these two, could the development do a 247 instead of 249 houses? Immediate, no. Uh, I, I don't really, I, I didn't think we were going to get anywhere. Now, in the last couple of days, I guess there was things happening, and maybe I don't know all the details, but, but it was tough. It was tough negotiating with, with Hal. And, and he's not, uh, he's a busy man. He's not available. But when he was available, we all changed our schedules. And we were there. Hal's coming. It was either, usually a Monday morning. Hal's coming Monday morning. And we were all there because we wanted to make, to make this work. So to, to put in the deed notifications is, is, is one last thing. So right now, one runway is closed at my home airport at night. Why? Because in that trajectory that Mr. Lamb showed you, trees grew up. There's actually rising terrain and the trees grew up. I dealt with this once about 15 years ago, and we got permission to trim the trees. But now the owner, and I tried to buy the land so I could continually keep the trees from projecting into the, into the what's that called, Mr. Lamb? The runway protection? Approach surface. Approach surface, yeah, it's, it, the trees are going to the approach surface. Well, now the owner, who's a friend of mine, a builder in the area, ironically, he says no because they're blocking the view of the development down there. I don't want to see it. He sold that land to the developer, but now he doesn't want to look at the land, and now he won't let it. So now if I try to go to I have business in Ohio, if I try to fly home at night and it's instrument conditions, I cannot fly that instrument approach. So this is why it's important to just have the air rights. And, and, and Hal has agreed to all three of these things. He's agreed to these. So we said, OK, would you initial this, these paragraphs, P, Q, and R, or whatever they are? And, and, and he goes, oh, no, I can't give you anything in writing. You'll have to take my word for it. Ah, I was broken. I knew I was going to have to fly back from Knoxville at that point. You know what I mean? So that's all, that's all we want. The, the deed notifications, the air easement cost nothing. Nobody will even notice it in the deed. People said to me, when you bought the house, did you see it? And I go, I don't remember. You know what I mean? You just want the house. 
But, it, but if I did try to cause trouble, at least a judge would say, sir, this is right here. You know what I mean? It could, it could mitigate. It could help us. So um, now, the runway protection zone, that might cost them a little bit of money. But what we've said is you've got to have green space anyway, so can you put it all here, all straight, so that if I do lose power and I'm heavy in August when family comes to the beach and they want rides in Uncle Bobby's plane and Uncle Bobby's helicopter and that thing goes down, I go to Bell Helicopter School every year so that I can learn if that engine dies, I can at least put it down and slide forward without tumbling. You know what I mean? We all practice this stuff, but, but it's like... You know, I got a friend who likes to say, I'll fight Goliath all day long, but you got to give me some stones. You know what I mean? So, so I do think this development can exist, coexist with an airport, but we, but, but we got to have this runway protection zone. It'll be peace of mind for everybody. I thank you and admire you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so you're next. Give us something different. Oh, yeah. don't worry, don't worry. Um, or maybe possibly some more detail. Um, do, do you have my stuff or no? I got it. <coughs> I got it. If you don't. Come here. Thank you. Exhibit for you. It's actually in there, but it's not. Um, is that this? Is that the same as this? Yeah, but let me. I'd rather. Can I put this in? And it, it is the same as that, but. PDF or PowerPoint, which do you prefer? Uh, want me to drive or you want to drive? Thank you. Um, hey, yo, you're getting noisy again over there. Be quiet, yeah. Knock <laughs> it off. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, hi, hello. Uh, good, good day to see you, members of the Sussex County Planning and Zoning Committee. Um, my name is Jeff King. I'm a resident of Eagle Crest Aerodrome and the owner of Electronics Consulting Company. I possess extensive experience in TV and radio engineering, including audio engineering. I've served on various governmental committees, including three airport boards, where I engage in discussion on crucial aviation planning issues. Additionally, I served. Additionally, I serve as the airport support representative for AOPA, a renowned aviation advocacy organization committed to preserving and protecting airports across the United States. We had to say whether we were in opposition or, or against. Uh, I'm sorry, we were in opposition or we were for it. Well, not for it, but I wasn't against it necessarily. I'm kind of neutral with conditions. Um, to, to, to really, the, really, the conditions are, are what Mr. Wheatley asked. What are the negative impacts on the airport? The negative impacts on the airport are 500 angry voters that don't like the noise 10 years from now. You know, they feel like they've been cheated or they didn't know or they're, you know, I have to tell you, if the angry voters were a reason for denying subdivisions, <laughs> we would never approve a single one. Oh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, so that, so, so it happens. Give me a little more than about 500 angry voters. Okay. Well, we, we, it actually happened where I came from. We had, we had a subdivision. There was no planning done. Oh. They just put an airport over top without any notifications at all. Um, before I continue, I do want to address briefly um, uh, Attorney Robertson's question um, about lead. And I, I saw how, how uh, in fact, uh, we, we, we're cutting our own throat. But, but let me tell you why, though. We, we, we actually wrung our hands over this. Um, there's, there's, currently, there's an EPA uh, engagement finding right now taking, taking uh, comment in D.C. right now that's going to say the same thing, essentially, that um, uh, Mr. Shear did, that, that there are issues with lead in aviation fuel, an aircraft going over there. Um, 
Mr. Bassan was correct. It's a lefty thing, but that's where catalytic converters started, and it's going to happen. So we, we felt it better to disclose that ahead of time instead of everyone finding out a year and a half from now. So that's why we did that. Um, it sounds like there's, it's a problem that they already have a solution for. They have a problem, and, and there is a solution, but it's going to take a couple years to, to occur. Well, it's going to take a couple years for him to get permits. Hopefully. Before he ever builds his yeah. house, if it, if it even gets approved, which is not a... Yeah, it's more of a disclosure thing we were concerned about, you know, just full disclosure on no, everyone's part. Okay, I, I, I have a better perspective now. Sure. Okay, go ahead. Uh, today I'd like to address my concerns regarding the twin mass development, specifically I'll address substantial aircraft noise levels, aviation environment issues, and their prospective impact on future homeowners in the twin mass developments if these concerns remain unaddressed and undisclosed. And I'll, I will move this along. I, I, I don't want to, I, I won't keep you here very long. Um, contrary to what we heard from the aviation consultant, there are twin engine aircraft on the, on the field, very loud aircraft, there's at least two of them. I own one of them. And they navigate the uh, proposed some the altitude is less than 150 feet. Well, apparently it's 70 feet. I didn't know that. So they're going 70 feet above the, <laughs> above the homes. And then we're producing noise levels in, at exceed 100 decibels. That's loud. That's very loud. Um, such noise levels are known to cause discomfort and can be harmful over extended periods. Just to give you an idea, these are the headphones that we wear in our aircraft. You know, the, they're very tight, very strong. Um, one of the... Boy, one of the things here I'm a little bit concerned about is I demonstrated how loud these aircraft are to the applicant and the applicant's attorney. They were over meeting, up, meeting us. I ran my aircraft up to full power outside, outside the building we were in, further away than the 70 feet, and I was told by everyone that it was deafening. They couldn't even talk to each other. You know, a little bit disappointed in that. that, that uh, we're just looking for notification. Um, Unfortunately, we, their consultant, Delta, Delta Airport Consultants, has submitted an exhibit and made testimony that selectively presents information and admits crucial facts. A paramount fact admitted is that Sussex County granted nonconforming use to Eagle Crest Airport in 2018, implying enhanced protection. Are we a public airport? No. But we're more than a private airport. We're an airport that this county recognizes. That's, that, that, that means something. It should mean something. The distinction between private and public airports does not negate the relevance of health and safety con considerations. There's no magic wand here. Just because you're private or public doesn't mean these concerns go away. Um, and more specifically, these concerns fall under the purview of the board and are mandated by Delaware Code 68, Section 6802. Additionally, uh, th this submission that was made and the testimony made employs irrelevant facts and downplays audio terms like DNL. How many of you know what DNL, DBA, all the terms that we're going? Probably not all of you. You know, you probably don't know some of the stuff I'm talking about. Um, but I will tell you that DNL is an average, an average over 24 hours. Um, you can have a noise event of 110, almost break your eardrums, 110 dB. If it happens once a day, that's 65 DNL. So, what was shown was not really, people don't care about DNL, people care about how loud something is. Um, additionally, um, the reliance on data from Georgetown Airport disregards the spatial differences and development dis density, which is radically different. With the closest home to the departure at Delaware, or I'm sorry, at Georgetown, being 3,500 feet away, and just a single home, not a dense cluster subdivision is proposed here less than half the distance away. Let me give you an analogy. Imagine living, living next to a railroad track, experiencing periodic intense noise disruptions amid, amidst prevailing quiet, except worse, with engines topping 600 horsepower with no muffler and, and propeller tips creating a sonic boom. It, it's not known that the, the airplanes, most of the noise is not at, at full throttle is not actually from the engine. It's from the tips of those propellers going at a supersonic speed. That's loud. Um, sorry, I lost my track. Um, this, this, my analogy, this, this literally will, you'll feel the sound in your body. If you're underneath, if you're on the ground underneath, you will literally will feel it in your chest. The windows will shake. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I, I invite any of you to come out and we'll, we'll demonstrate what, what it actually will sound like to a homeowner there. 
Um, this analogy will illustrate life in twin mats for homeowners with the caveat that future buyers may remain unaware of the tracks in the sky. They need to know. Uh, Mr. Wheatley, uh, rightly so, um, in the past has said, give us something to work with, give us some, some laws. And in looking through, I found a few things that might be of, of relevance. Of course, F FAA Advisory Circular 150 that talks about airport design standards. Again, private, public, the noise doesn't know. Uh, I did provide that in the packet if you're interested. Del Chapter 25, Title VI of the Delaware Code, which requires disclosure, disclosure of noise, disclosure of environmental issues. Um, and of course, Delaware Code Chapter 68, Section 6802, which sets you know the tone for P and Z, health and safety, your bigger, your bigger issues. But some of the proposed actions that, that I want to propose that this board that this board make or, or require, uh, considering the potential harm and environmental issues, I propose the following actions for for this committee's urgent consideration. One. Mandate full disclosure. Require Twin Mass to disclose all potential and future buyers to significant noise levels and aviation related environmental issues that would, they would be exposed to and maintain disclosure through covenants or deed, deed restrictions. Two, implement noise mitigation measures. We want effective soundproofing in the homes within the development to mitigate the impact of aircraft noise on the residents. Three, Reevaluate the development plans considering the significant noise and environmental implication ensuring compatibility with the noise environment as per FAA guidelines. And number four, and this is where we really can, really can work well here, uh, use county mandated open space. County requires at least 30% 30, 30 open space. Use this intelligently to create noise barriers as well as clear emergency landings to enhance safety. You can't have, you, you can't have enough safety really. Um, We've had other developments that have worked with us, whether by chance or, or, or on purpose. This is, the, we're looking right now at uh, what's called Painier's Mill, which is south of us. Uh, they have a strip of open land that aligns with our runway that's totally clear, and it has trees on either side. What, what do the trees do? Well, they look nice, but they also mitigate noise, you know. This is the kind of thing that, that everyone can work together on. You folks up here, the developer, and us, to make a win-win for everybody. Um, and, and this is the kind of stuff we're looking for, open areas. We don't want to hit a house. You know, we want to live. You know, we're, we're, we're going to, you know, we want some place, you know. I, I, I've been in an airplane accident, and I was lucky that they planned for open space. Um, I sent the video over it, but that was me. And that's because the airport planned to have open little splotches of land. You know, stuff happens. There's plenty of farmland right now, plenty of farmland. What's it going to be like in 20 years? Planning, you know, planning. We want to plan for the future. Um, now, I'm concerned the developer will leave after selling their homes, regulating the political and environmental fallout to the community residents. Addressing these concerns preemptively will secure future residents and ensure adherence to FAA guidelines and the health and safety that mandates that PNZ operates under. <coughs> um, I, had a, I had a few questions or comments, but I am glad to hear the, the uh, Statue of Liberty analogy didn't come up, and I was surprised that, that we're only 70 feet over top of their homes. I thought we were 150, but we're actually lower than I thought. Uh, but that's it, basically. Thank you for your time and consideration. I trust your commitment to me and the highest standards. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer Thank you. Them. Sure. I appreciate your testimony. Sure. All right, who's next? Should I just leave us for the... <coughs> yeah, okay, over, that's fine. Over here. You're, you're, you're next, sir, and then I think the guy behind you had his hand in the air. You want to speak, sir? Did you want to speak? Yeah. You're next. Go ahead. Good evening. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to speak. I did not go to Virginia Tech. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a proud I, mountaineer. I, I didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> West Virginia University. Uh, anyway, um, I appreciate uh, the discussion about noise abatement uh, because my primary concern, <clears throat> excuse me, is I think we're kind of Groundhog Day. We talked about this before. What constitutes a superior design? <clears throat> and right now, as the ordinance stands, it's somewhat nebulous. It's subjective. So um, I'm trying to understand what would make this particular subdivision superior. It has buffers, but they're already mandated, whether it's a cluster subdivision or not. 
So uh, I met with the engineers and we had a nice discussion about potential ways to um, promote groundwater or stormwater infiltration so we do not pave over and destroy the, uh, the function, the natural function of groundwater infiltration. The best groundwater infiltration you can have is under forest vegetation. So I would promote and advocate that you really reconsider the subdivision plan uh, because it does still con contain a significant amount of forest reduction. So um, I, I'm not naive to think that you're actually going to de deny these people their ability to develop this piece of land in perpetuity. However, you do have the discretion and you have a mandate as to why you even exist, and that is to protect the natural features of the county, people's safety, and, of course, uh, the integrity of our natural resources. A, an excavated stormwater management infiltration basin uh, does not clean water. As a matter of fact, it's a conduit for contaminants into the shallow groundwater because you are lowering the elevation, the natural elevation, to within literally feet of where the, uh, the water table is. Whereas forest vegetation, you have interception, you have the duff layer, the good doctor spoke about lead, chelation, you can't find a better chelation mechanism than the organic matter under forest vegetation. So I think if the developer and their associates really give some consideration, they could make a very fine subdivision by maintaining as much of the forest as they possibly can, using it for passive open space, using it for groundwater infiltration, walking trails, and I'm sure a few of y'all grew up playing in the woods. You remember what that was like, right? So I would think it would be a great amenity for any young kids to have a place they can go, run around, make forts, and uh, really enjoy Mother Nature. By the way, I'm a retired wildlife biologist from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'm a certified professional soil scientist, so I think I can speak to some credibility, with some credibility. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your, appreciate your relevant credentials there. Indeed. Yes, sir. Come on up. Howdy, folks. Can you hear me? Sure can. And your name is? My name is Joe Larimore. I live at 15159 Hudson Road, okay. right next to the airport. I'm on the airport grounds. Okay. Uh, I wanted to just rebuttal the road count thing she mentioned. Okay. I live there. Every morning at 6 o'clock I get up. I watch truck after truck after truck, construction people, Atlantic Concrete, different ones, electric companies, plumbing, right. heading down my road. There's probably about 15 developments going on down that way. And uh, on weekends, forget it. If there's an accident especially, I cannot get out of my house. I have to sometimes drive through the field in the backyard to Eagle Crest Road. Every morning when I want to go to work in Milford, I never go to the right out of my driveway to go Hudson Road to Route 1. I go the other way all the way around Eagle Crest Road, and I cross over there. It's a lot safer, a lot less congested. There's always 10 or 15 cars stacked up there. They're all the way by the Round, Pit, Round Bridge Pole Road. So those people are going to be really screwed up trying to get out of there until they do something with a – we need a red light badly, but the, the highway department is – I don't know what the heck's wrong with those guys. They, when, they, when that 16 light leaves us, you're going to be able to drive from five points to Canada without stopping. <laughs> there won't be in a red light. That's the last red light, really. Think about it. All right, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Julie, come on up. I have the, thank you. Hi, my name is Yu Lee, 22483 Ridge Circle. I have nothing to say about aviation. I have some questions, and it's basically uh, from the packets, online packets that I read. But 
unlike you who have to read thousands of pa pages for each meeting, I just pick up a few pages and come up with my own arguments. So uh, one of the things that I had questioned about Ed Lene was when he first showed the, the map of the zone A, zone B, right. in my opinion or in my understanding, zone A is 50 feet and it is not negotiable. But when I looked at the map, there are certain areas that are wider, certain areas are thinner. So I don't understand how that could be zone A. Never less than 50. Well, and I can answer this too. Okay. So, we, and this is, I was going to mention this later. Because this is kind of the first one that the commission's seen that has to comply with the resource buffer requirements. We had one that was voluntary right. a while yeah. back. Yeah. Um, this one has to comply. You know, I suggested that we send it through Mr. Whitehouse's office and County Engineering's office. They reviewed it, uh, and as a result of that, there's a staff memo for Mr. Whitehouse based on input from engineering that says it complies with the resource buffer requirements. So, I mean, I think that answers the question. Okay. All right. Um, and that's an independent review from our staff. Yes. So, um, I basically here because it was withdrawn and all the public comments from previous application was gone and when I saw that I thought you know maybe I have something to say so that's why I'm here and I think that's procedurally unfair because you know many people may not feel like they want to uh, submit the comment again so maybe you could look at that as a procedure in the future um, and I was happy to see that there was a mention of the ecological network map. That's Exhibit 16, as we saw earlier. And <clears throat> it was mentioned in page 19 of the booklet. And in there, as we have heard from uh, uh, Mackenzie earlier, uh, there is a, uh, important, ecologically important areas. But then uh, some areas have been cleared in late 60s for the road project, and they are not considered old growth. But even though it may not be since 1937, they are at least like 50 years old. And in this town, 50 years old trees are really old when we consider all those little saplings that we are planting nowadays. And then it has to be cleared because of the safety hazard and intermittent water retention they have. So I was wondering where this uh, barrel pit was, but in the uh, Exhibit 16, there was no um, delineation or demarcation of the barrel pits and also the subdivision. So I tried to see as much as I could. So um, I got this uh, Delaware Ecological Network uh, blow up, and on the side is the um, in context of the whole region. And then <clears throat> I overlaid the, the barrel pits and as I overlay the colors get dimmer. So this is the, the barrel pit area here and then when I overlay the subdivision the, this whole area, this, this whole area is the Delaware network, uh, in, um, environmental network core area. This whole thing is cut down because the barrel pits are conveniently there. And the construction noises and the vibration could disrupt the animals and the marine life. And that's all in this area. So uh, this is how it looks like over the satellite image. So the subdivisions over here will all be without the existing forests. And the next question I have is about TIS. I looked at the um, page 26 that has crash data, and the crash data was taken uh, March 2019 through March 22. That was like during the slow time. And Ms. then, Lee, the, yes. The Del that already testified that they yes, didn't I know. use information I know. from I, the, I prepared this one before I heard that. Okay. So, okay. and then it says the crash data within 0.1 mile radius, and I, 
looked up, it's 528 feet. My driveway is 170 feet. My neighbor's driveway is 650 feet. Five, I don't know why the crash data is looked at only within 0.1 mile radius of the intersection. And then uh, I think the TIS is not adequate. Um, the, the increased vehicle impact is not all about numbers. It's not all about LOS or ADT that we hear so much about. And <clears throat> driving on the uh, uh, Round Pole Bridge and Savannah Road will be a totally different experience because their underlying conditions are different. So I think <clears throat> this TIS or even the scoping fail to recognize there are no intersection to do the intersection analysis, but there are five, at least five 90 degree bends, and th those bends come with the risks. They are not concerned, uh, considered. And then the terrain and the road condition. You know, the roads are, roads are narrow. It's not about the number of uh, cars going by. It's about, you know, what kind of condition they are driving about. And then there are wildlife. And during the crash data period, November 1st, 20, 2021, there was a, a personal injury due to the, the deer. Um, and that is from the public uh, crash data available. And then here I see Delaware Route 54 in the TIS, and I was wondering where that was. You see that? So why is this in, in this TIS? And uh, I looked at the current volume versus the increase. What does the 16% translate to um, in regards to the increase? So 16% eastbound and 16% westbound. And then the peak hour uh, from Twin Mass to Milton would be this, and then um, back and forth. Eastbound from Milton, this way, from Milton to Hudson is this number, and Milton to tw Twin Mast is this, and then the future <coughs> would be almost 300%. But when I looked at the AM peak hours, Hudson to Milton, Twin Mass to Milton, so this is the increase. You look at the AM number going from 0 to 22. Why? Why are there so many suddenly, there used to be 0, now it's 22. Are they going to school or work? And this is the kind of increase that we don't talk about. And when something is increased from zero, no matter what that number is, it's an infinite increase. Zero to one is inc infinite, math-wise. Um, and then turning. This is also uh, from that TIS report. When turning from Hudson North right turn, that's the number here. Peak hour is seven. Going the other way, peak hour is two. And then when you uh, turn from Hudson to Rampo Road, um, that is uh, the same thing. I, I'll just go through this. Oh, sorry. This is about the heavy trucks. Going this way or this way from Hudson Road, there's no, no truck at all. No heavy truck. Zero, zero. Zero heavy truck. Why is that? And then the intersection of um, pedestrian. There are no pedestrian either, all zero. So why is that? Maybe the road is not safe. But the, uh, the next four uh, um, screens I just bypassed because they were the same. And here, um, the several infrastructure improvement projects are in the area, and we heard about some of those and some dates go to 25 or 28. And traffic situation is bad during the road improvement period. You know, as somebody said, if there's a flagger, many cars may be routed to Round Pole area. Construction cannot coincide with the road improvement, especially in this area. And until all the improvements are in place, 
the heavy construction or logging vehicles should not be allowed in this area. So that was it for me. And I have a few other questions. The barrel pit, it's a temporary one, uh, but it has to be filled. And when they fill, they will have to bring in heavy equipment to compact the field area. That means more heavy uh, traffic volume there. And I think we need to reconsider Del Dot MOU to think about the road conditions, not just the, the numbers and the LOS. Um, and if you approve this one, there may be more people traveling to Georgetown to attend the planning and zoning meeting or council <laughs> meeting, so please consider that too. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have to tell you, I don't think threatening is effective. Uh, I really don't, because I've been doing this a long time, and I don't have to be anywhere until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, so I'll just We love okay. public engagement, too. Yeah. Sir. Hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Calvagironi. I own Lot 16 Hudson Road in the Eagle Crest Aerodrome. Uh, probably one of your newest property owners in Sussex County. Uh, I'm an attorney from Alaska. I uh, own a law firm there. About a third of my practice is aviation law. I'm a panel attorney with the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. I'm a board member of the uh, Alaska Airmen's Association. And I say I, I bring that up because I regularly practice in front of the FAA. I regularly practice in front of the NTSB. And uh, I'm very familiar with a lot of the advocacy efforts um, that AOPA and other similar organizations have undertaken uh, for a lot of the issues that we're talking about tonight. Um, as a personal note, uh, graduate from Villanova Law, and that's many moons ago. Um, but it was when I was a law student at Villanova that I first started coming down uh, and spending time with friends in Milton, going to the beach, and really realized at that point what a special community this is. And it was something I knew maybe someday when I could afford it, I wanted to be a part of this community. And uh, part of that introduction to this community was the fact that my friends down here lived right next to the Eagle Crest Aerodrome. And I said, you know what? That is the perfect kind of community where I'd like to retire someday. Um, <clears throat> last year, my friend who's a realtor in town sent me a listing of a, of a house that rarely comes up for sale. Looked at it, I said, eh, it's a little bit early. Uh, networked in the community, ended up finding a beautiful piece of the land. And we're several thousands of dollars uh, in at this point, architectural plans to eventually build a hangar home um, and add to the community. So. Why is all that relevant? Um, this choosing the, there's a lot of flying communities around the United States, but I chose this community because it's very special. And um, you know, I, I love the vibe of Sussex County. I love the fact that it's rural, but it's still close to Philadelphia, where I spent so much of my career before I moved to Alaska. It's close to D.C. It's really the best of all worlds. Uh, and I can't wait to be here, and I can't wait to provide my small investment in the community. I'm going to be taking the Delaware Bar exam in February and, and eventually shifting my law practice here. Um, but through a lot of my advocacy efforts with, uh, with AOPA, I understand uh, that small airports around the country, and, and the aviation expert could probably testify to this, are under attack and get closed regularly for exactly the issues that we're talking about tonight, um, specifically as it relates to noise and proximity to the airport. And um, what's most important to me as we go through this process, and I submitted some written comments as well, not a NIMBY, you know, development is, it has both positives and negatives, but you know, other people have the right to come to this community and have an affordable home to live in addition as me. So not opposed to the, to the development in principle. What's most important to me is recording something that runs with the land that, per, that protects our airport in the future. It's an important part of this community's history, and it's going to be an important part of this community's future. And what our attorneys at our HOA's expense have proposed to the developer uh, to that end, more so than what could appear in declarations or CCNRs, which can be amended at any time by a certain percentage of the homeowners, what's most important is something that runs with the land, a permanent easement that protects our ability to maintain our airport in the future. And, and that's been negotiated, and that's been drafted up, and those, those, those attorney's fees have already been spent. 
Um, and that's all it's going to cost the developer. Um, I uh, had plans to fly my airplane down next month. I moved that up when I heard about this meeting, similar to one of the individuals that testified earlier. I flew my airplane from Alaska, uh, landed uh, here yesterday, um, and going to keep my airplane here uh, over the winter. Um, but anyway, I ask that this board take that into consideration um, and help this airport survive moving forward. Thanks. All right, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Come on up. You're going to tell us something new, right? Absolutely. Well, no, wait a minute now. We've already seen that video once. I want you to come up here and tell me what you're going to tell me. We've seen that video. I'll be able to show you what I'm talking about. Well, why don't you tell us, and then we'll decide. I will. Thank you very much. Right. My name is John Chertia. I live at 29633 Eagles Crest Road. That's in Eagles Crest Homeowners Association. I currently okay. am a pilot, and I serve as president of the Eagle Crest Homeowners Association. And I thought maybe it would be time to bring you a little bit of reality of somebody flying out of Eagle Crest Aerodrome. And if there's any way you can put this up, I'd like to show you a real-life situation of what happens, of what can happen. There you go. Okay, let me ask you to stop it shortly here. Run it a little bit more. Right there. Excellent. If you look down the runway, you'll take it up just a little bit more. Take it up another stop. Excellent. That shows you straight on the flight plat path going out of Eagle Crest Aerodrome. The first property you see there, you know what it is. It's Pintail Point. It's 39 units that are off to the left there, and there's a path through Pintail Point. That path was created, I don't know how long ago, you probably know better than I do, but probably 25, maybe 30 years ago that that community maybe less than that, that it was created. And when they created that, the gentleman who just spoke, Joe Larimore, was president of the association, and what he did is he met with the developer, he met with planning and zoning, and they decided to keep that open area that you're looking at right there. It's in excess of 100 feet. Beyond that, you'll see a vacant lot. It's a farmland. And then beyond that, the lighter complexion, field is twin mast subdivision, proposed subdivision, 249, all within the flight path of Eagle Crest Aerodrome. So the real life story that I'd like to tell you about, I've, I've been flying for 68 years. I've been flying out of Eagle Crest for about half of that time. In that time, I've flown this path right here many, many times. One morning, my daughter and I, my daughter Heather, is a pilot as well. We were taken off in my gyroplane. If you know what a gyroplane is, it's with the big, big wing up or big uh, propeller up on top, and it looks like a cross between a helicopter and a grasshopper. Well, it's called a gyroplane. We were taken off right here. For some reason, I don't know what the reason was. Heather doesn't either. We landed in right where that little white shed is. We landed in that area right there. And we landed there. We call it an off-field off -field landing. But that's where we ended up, right in there. If that subdivision had not been planned by you and the developer, and the Eagle Crest Homeowners Association, there would have been more houses in there. And you would have seen a newscast featuring a burning gyro, gyroplane like one of those houses that you saw a little bit earlier. So this, where we are right now, this is not a negotiation between the developer and us. It's a, our plea to you to do the right thing. And the right thing is to give us a path through there. There right now, there's a pickleball court in there and planning and parking lots 
and also utility infrastructure. So that's strictly up to you. You're going to make a decision of what goes forward. I wish you luck in that decision because it's a tough one. But as Paul, if you're young enough or old enough to remember Paul Harvey, he would always end up by saying, and that's the rest of the story. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, sir. Very nice. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Who's next? All the way over here. Let's go on this side. Now, we would like to hear something a little different. Yeah, you know, I, don't, I don't have anything new, but I just wanted to say I'm opposed. Uh, Mark Nardi, I live on Round Pole Bridge Road for the last 24 years. Okay. Um, I'm opposed to the uh, development, mostly on the basis of the road, and what I see is a flawed traffic in TIS, uh, the okay. study, all right. uh, due to lapses in the data. The data tables are incomplete. No. Okay. So that's all. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay, who's next? Yes, sir. Come on up here. Something different. Yeah, I got, uh, well, I got a comment about something I saw on the slide tonight. All right. um, my name, name is Charlie is? Quant, and I live on Hudson Road. Okay. And I'm a pilot, and I have an airplane in my hangar. And uh, so I don't want to talk about any of that. What I see is my concern is all the traffic on Hudson Road. And some, Joe Laramore pointed out about all the construction trucks. Yep. Uh, all spring we had logging trucks going up there all day long. And then in the evening they all came back. And, uh, but what I saw on the slide tonight, maybe one of the engineers can address, yeah. at the last hearing they talked about restricting access out of the subdivision onto Round Pole Road with the right turn only. And if that happened, that means everybody coming out of the, all, all those, how many, how many trips a day would they talked about? <laughs> yeah, would have to go to Milton, basically, or go down there somewhere and U-turn and come back. But that would keep them off Hudson Road, so that's a good thing for me. So, and where I saw it tonight was on the, uh, when you're talking about the two wells and the sewage and treatment facilities. I'm going to ask you to face this way, sir. You need I'm to direct your comments to us. If we think they need to be asked something, we'll ask them. You go ahead. Right. So, they had a little picture. He was explaining where the uh, utilities were, the, yeah. the sewage yeah. treatment or something like that, and the two wells. And the, if you looked at, there was a median in the uh, exit there showing all the traffic. It was that feature they talked about. Somebody had mentioned it. The last meeting, they were as a ways to mitigate the traffic down at uh, Round Pole Bridge and Hudson Road, the people trying to go out to Route 1, they said they would restrict it all the way, just a right turn only. Okay. So is that still in the plan? That's my question. Well, we'll get a clarification on that, but I suspect DelDot's probably had their way with them by now, and whatever's on the plan is probably what DelDot wants them to do. Well, that was on the plan tonight. We'll find out. Yeah. Okay, thank right. you. Okay, thank you. You want to respond to that, uh, Mr. Erickson? Sure. Real quick, please, to clarify. Sure. Uh, yeah, I believe what he saw is a channelized right turn lane. Um, so what that does is basically allows for a channelized right turn lane instead of an open one. Uh, it is not restricting movements in the other direction. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Jamie, would you do me a favor? Could you bring up that uh, very first graphic of twin mast? It's like an aerial photo with the overlay on it. In the meantime, my name is John Doring. I live uh, at the corner of Eagle Crest and Hudson Road. I'm a pilot. My testimony is going to take about 30 seconds, but it's going to be the best one you've heard tonight. <laughs> as soon as we get the picture up. That was more pretty high. I think you're right. <laughs> Sound like sound like you're running for office. <laughs> Perfect. That's it. Okay. Uh, right where the uh, black box is on the bottom, it says solutions. That is the end of our runway. This development is too close to the runway. If you look at the uh, gap on the left, it has a blue-colored pond, some buildings, another blue-colored pond. That's supposed to be the runway protection zone. So we're taking off under that black box. We're supposed to crash land through curbs and gutters, ponds, clubhouses, parking lots, pickleball courts, and then we get to the second runway protection zone. Whoopee. 
<laughs> That's all I want to say. We need common sense here. That was Thank 45 you. seconds. <laughs> okay, who's next? All the way in the back. Yes, ma'am. Come on up. Okay, we've, we've 